today. Uh, so many of you may know me in my uh, longtime role and, of course, continuing role as Adobe's PDF architect. But in addition to that role for the last two years or so, I've also been working in this area that we're going to talk about today of content authenticity. And I've been leading the efforts at Adobe uh, and elsewhere uh, in the world of content authenticity. And so I'm going to talk to you about uh, what's been going on there uh, and a new standards organization that I helped found uh, to drive that effort. So let's go ahead and talk about this. So what's what's the problem? Why was this group necessary? What's the the situation? I think most of you are probably familiar with this in your in your own personal lives and have come across this, which is that you don't know what to trust online. You may have heard of terms like deep fakes. Uh, for example, and fake news. Uh, and this is all around us, and we see various organizations trying to address it through different approaches, but they're all unique and different. Uh, and a big part of why this problem exists is that users simply don't know uh, where the things they're viewing come from. And so the goal that we are trying to achieve as this organization called the uh, consortium for content attribution and provenance, uh, content provenance and attribution is to attach that attribution and history to assets. Uh, and, you know, it should come of no surprise that, <clears throat> as I said, you have to do this as a standard. You have to do this in the open. You have to do this as a group. And this is why, of course, we here in the PDF Association have partnered with the ISO but there are many other organizations that we, the association partner with, and also that the consortium partners with for all of the same reasons, to make sure that this is done in an open standards manner. So what is the C2PA? Uh, and that's how we refer to ourselves, much shorter, much easier to remember. Uh, so the C2PA is a project that was organized as a joint development foundation project. Uh, and our mission is to focus and develop on the technical specifications uh, around content provenance and authenticity at scale. Um, and we're looking not only from creation and authorship, but all the way through professional pro publishing and all the way to the consumer who's looking at this at these assets on the web, in Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on their government's websites email to them, wherever it may come from, and those consumers wanting and desiring to understand the history, the origins of the media that they're consuming. So how did this group come about? And how are we moving it forward? So it actually came about from two other organizations. You may have heard of the Content Authenticity Initiative. That was an organization started by Adobe, Twitter, and the New York Times just about two years ago. And a similar organization from, there was uh, Microsoft, the BBC, and the CBC called Project Origin. Uh, and we both had very similar goals, but from very similar, but from somewhat dissimilar, I should say, uh, approaches. And but we realized that at the end of the day, we were all trying to solve the same problem. So by bringing those two organizations together, along with other industry initiatives, uh, we've formed liaisons with organizations like the IPTC, with Etsy, and with others. Uh, we're able to create these standards, the specification that I'm going to talk about today, uh, and then also produced, and we will be producing a series of best practices, implementations, and others that can then be implemented and used throughout the world and throughout the industries. So who are we today? Uh, this slide is actually slightly dated. We're about 30 some odd members at this point, but you can see that this is a wide ranging initiative. Software companies such as Adobe and Microsoft, hardware companies, ARM and Intel, uh, companies that are involved in the publishing industry, CBC, BBC, New York Times, but also companies you might not have thought of. Also, uh, for example, uh, we have Witness, which is focused on human rights um, considerations. We have CDNs like Fastly and Akamai. 
uh, and a variety of other organizations that focus on all sorts of different aspects of this area coming together to help us produce proper, correct specifications that can be utilized throughout the world <clears throat> in all the areas that that entails. So what is it that we're building? We're building attribution. We're building a systems for attribution. And why attribution? Well, a lot of people would rather go after the uh, detection problem. How do I detect that something is fake? Well, the problem with detection is detection is an arms race. That's like copy protection of old. You know, the more, as soon as you're able to detect something, the um, bad guys will go out and create a better fake. Uh, we don't want that. We want a system that says, this is where it comes from, this is who did what, because the other thing to consider is that edits are good. Uh, there's nothing wrong with editing something. We don't need necessarily the original. We just simply need to know where something started and what happened to it throughout its lifetime. So the goal here is to provide all of the information that can be used by someone to determine whether or not they trust it and whether or not they consider this content authentic um, in its aspect. And so this is attribution, and this is what we're focusing on. So what is attribution? It's who did something, it's what did they do? When did they do it? Potentially where did the act take place? Maybe even why something was done? And how did you do it? What tools were used? What processes were used? Um, to accomplish the goal. And so by combining all of these things together, um, and, you know, and not all of them are required at any one time, but these are the components that make up attribution and what we want to incorporate into the information that's included along with every one of our assets. Uh, and so you put all that together, what are we building uh, at the C2PA? What we're building is a model for storing and accessing cryptographically verifiable and tamper evident information whose trustworthiness can be assessed based on a defined trust model. So we want to leverage core technologies around tamper evidence and verifiability. And we need to also incorporate and focus on this idea of trust and to have a model to help users and ourselves um, understand what it is that it can be trusted and why. So what does that mean? What exactly does it mean to trust something and, and trustworthiness? So we look at two aspects of the trust model. The first thing is that inside of the file as part of the data that's being incorporated, we're incorporating what we call trust signals. And the reason for this is that trust is not a thumbs up or a thumbs down value. You can't represent it that way, especially when trust doesn't necessarily represent the same thing to two individuals, because somebody who might trust news source one might be, you know, is not someone who would trust news source two and vice versa. And so instead, and this is why I, I love this particular picture, we think about trust signals. Each piece of information that we can use to provide a signal, a di some sort of information to the consumer, and that consumer could be a human, it could be a machine, that then either raises or lowers the trustworthiness of a given asset. Uh, and so this is why we think of it again on this sort of scale. And, and, and while this uses sort of numbers, we just think of it as this general scale of trustworthiness. Now, all of these signals come together, but at the end of the day, we need to understand and represent and recognize who or what established that trust. And that is the signer. So as I mentioned, we use cryptographically verifiable information. Those are digital signatures. Those are the same core digital signature technology and underpinnings that are present in PDF today with a little bit of modernization, which I'll talk about but it's still about digital signatures. And so the signer is the core of the trust model. If you trust the signer, then you are going to trust and rely on the information and the signals contained within that asset. If you don't trust that signer or trust that signer a little less than you might, then 
you may trust those signals a little less. But I'll show you how we've also found ways to, you, again, adjust those levels of trust, even where you might not under, necessarily trust the signer, you might trust previous signers, or you might trust what we call actors that are involved in the system. So let's continue and talk a little bit more. But at the end of the day, I want you to remember that the, syst the whole process, the whole system is based on trust. It has to be, because that's what we're trying to establish here, is users, consumers trusting the assets that they've received. Okay, so I've talked about part of this already. I've talked about the fact that we're creating the set of verifiable metadata. That information has to be bound to the asset itself. Uh, and we support both what we call hard bindings and soft bindings. The difference being that a hard binding is based on uh, traditional cryptographic hashes, much like, again, PDF's hashing mechanism is. But we've also provided for soft bindings. Soft bindings come in a variety of, of forms, and in many ways, they differ based on the type of asset. Uh, you may have heard of terms like perceptual hashing, uh, or watermarking or thumbnailing. Uh, these are all concepts, different forms of soft binding, all of which can be utilized in different ways and with different asset types uh, within our infrastructure. And then the other piece, and we'll go into this in more detail, is that we have to have these series of statements and we call them assertions, uh, which represent each of the various things, these trust signals that you the signer, you the creator or generator wish to incorporate into the asset for the consumer downstream to know about the asset. Hence, when you take all these things together, this represents its providence. Now, when we went into this work, we needed to focus on um, really focusing on new things. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So we leverage a lot of uh, pre-existing technology. We will leverage cloud storage when it is available, but we don't require it. Uh, one of the things that's uh, coming up more and more, even within the PDF industry, is, as I mentioned, this idea of provenance or audit trails. We certainly need to incorporate those. And while today I'm talking about PDF, the work that we've done in the C2PA started with images, we're working with videos, we're working with audios, and also, of course, PDF. So all formats are relevant in this conversation. Uh, if you want to get into the really gory details, we have a draft specification available on our website. Uh, we will have an update. So this is draft 0 0.7. Uh, we expect to have an update to that shortly. And then we are planning to have our 1.0 uh, final draft, or at least the initial 1.0 version, uh, will be released by the end of the year. So we're moving very quickly with this work, uh, and we certainly welcome uh, any and all feedback. We have a public feedback forum, and I've noticed some uh, members of the association that have already submitted some feedback, and we appreciate that. So please keep that up. But let me get into um, a bit about what we've done. So as I mentioned, the the core of this is that we are going to produce what we call the C2PA manifest. And the manifest is the verifiable unit of all of these other things put together. And there's going to be a collection, in most cases, a manifest. You don't always have to have just one, because as a document, as a, an asset evolves over time, as edits take place, changes, as things are brought together, you know, we, the idea of merging multiple PDFs together is a very common operation in our world. Each one of those individual things brings their manifest into the picture in the form of what we call ingredients. So and we bring all of those manifests together into a manifest store. But within each manifest, as I mentioned, we have a series of assertions. These are the statements that are made. You can also incorporate individual credentials. So we support the W3C verifiable credential standard as a way to clearly identify an individual actor that's involved in an assertion. I'll show you an example of this shortly. All of the assertions and the credentials are gathered together and we call this a claim. So the claim 
rep gathers all that information together and it is then digitally signed to produce the claim signature. And so then all of this gets bundled together into our manifest. And if you look at this picture, um, you can see here uh, each one of these items here, these boxes going through time represent individual manifests. They rep represent things that happened at a given time. So this picture was taken, <clears throat> it was edited, it was recompressed. Uh, and then finally, we have the asset that the end user sees. Uh, and so again, along the way, we have each one of these things representing assertions, and we have the claim and the claim signature, uh, as you can see, signed by individual parties. All of that coming together to represent the provenance or the audit trail, if you will, of the asset um, throughout its life cycle. So let's dive a little bit and take a look at, at some more detail. I know that uh, folks here are, are good and technical. They like a little bit of depth. So I thought I, I'd show you some stuff. Now, this may look like JSON. What it actually is is what's called Seabor Diagnostics. Uh, so we use a technology called Seabor, uh, which is a binary representation of JSON. It's actually an extended binary representation. But the idea here that I want to show you is that um, this is one type of assertion. So this is an action. So when we want to represent when something took place, we can represent that um, an editing operation took place, when it took place, what was used to do, and this goes back to my original points. So what, when, how, what software agent did it, what exactly took place, we could put in details of the changes, uh, and we can put in the credential of the individual that did it. So in this case, we have a reference to Joe Blog's um, credentials. Uh, and so we can actually verify those and, and work with those. We can also see that another operation took place. So this is an array of actions. So in this case, um, a merge. So we took another PDF and we merged it in. Uh, we call that a placed action. Uh, and so, again, Acrobat here was used, but we merged in a PDF, and here's its original manifest. So I mentioned that if documents have these manifests, we're going to bring them all together and incorporate them into the final document so that we can track that um, history, that provenance, even in we're dealing with things like merging. Let's take a look at another assertion. Uh, another common type of assertion uh, is a creative work assertion. This is based on schema.org's creative work. So again, we leveraged a lot of pre-existing standards. Oh, the action assertion comes to us from XMP. So we didn't have to invent that wheel. Creative work from schema.org. We didn't have to invent that wheel. So here you can see the publisher, BBC News, being represented. We have, again, Joe Bloggs is the producer of this particular piece. So again, another link to Joe. Uh, we have information about the copyright from BBC. All of this now incorporated again as another assertion providing us this information. And then finally, uh, we need to hash this. So this is our hard binding uh, and we use a assertion for that. One of the things that you'll notice, and this is actually something we took from PD, we learned from our, you know, my work in PDF over the years, is that um, inclusionary hashes where you specify the range as we do today in PDF and you say, here's the range or ranges I'm going to sign. What we found is that exclusionary hashing was actually safer. Uh, and we've learned this in a couple of attacks against PDF. So in this case, we are using a, an exclusionary range model of data hashing. Uh, and I'll point out where that actually uh, works to our benefit uh, and also a little bit to our detriment as we think about how this connects to PDF. Uh, but we obviously are going to exclude, and we actually took advantage of the whole model, if you will, the HOLE model of PDF. So just as today we have sign the whole for signatures in PDF, we use a similar model for embedding the C2PA manifest in formats like PDF and JPEG and others. And then all of this comes together in a claim. So here, Joe's PDF editor um, is making this claim. 
I, it's listed the assertions that it's made, et cetera. So here's the claim all coming together with all the things I've showed you previously. And then, as I mentioned, we were gonna wanna sign that information. We're gonna sign that claim. So how do we do it? If you're familiar with digital signatures in PDF, none of this should come as a surprise, except for one little piece. We currently support the same X509 based certificates the PDF does today, although we are working in conjunction with a number of other organizations as the world looks at the future of certificates. Uh, so we are open to other forms, but today the only one we support is X509. We support the same common algorithms in PDF, ECDSA, and RSA, PSA, SSA. Um, we will be adding the current specification does not include support for elliptic curves, but we will be adding ED25519 in our next draft. So that is coming as well. The big change we did make, and we, we actually started using traditional CMS certificate, uh, CMS signing, but we switched from CMS to a digital signature standard called COSI which is the CBOR based signing model. And the reason we did that is, is a couple of reasons. One is that it aligns with our use of CBOR elsewhere. So now we didn't have to add CMS. So it would have added another technology, another parsing algorithm. <clears throat> we just didn't see that as a benefit to our implementers. Second is that the industry considers COSI because it is binary based rather than ASN1 based, much more secure and more reliable with respect to parsing and implementations. Uh, so that gave us uh, modern benefits, but we have the one downside because it is newer, there are less implementations for folks to choose from. So if folks who are looking for pre-existing open source, we'll find that the choices are more limiting uh, than they are if you were using CMS, but it's out there, it is in wide adoption. It's very, very popular in the IoT, the internet of things world. Okay, so we now understand we have these C2PA manifests with claims, signatures, assertions. How do we put these in the PDF? How are we gonna connect this with our world of PDF? Well, if you look in the current specification, you'll see the PDF was one of the first formats that we supported. And given that I really, given my history with PDF and my authorship of the C2PA specification, that should come as no surprise to anyone. Um, so today we did, so PDF is supported in a fairly logical approach, much like we've done with other things, which is that the C2PA manifest is an embedded file. It goes in the uh, global embedded files name tree. And of course we take advantage of the AF relationship key to specify, hey, this is the C2PA manifest. This enables us to use these in both 32,000 part one and 32,000 part two compatible files, because all of those are supported in both versions of PDF. It also works for not only for when you're creating a new file, but as you add update tables and as you update the PDF, you need only include the new manifest. So we don't have to duplicate data through each one of our things. We're just gonna bring in the new manifest that represents the changes that took place during that last set of operations. So this is where we are. We're gonna pull all that together and works really nicely. We've uh, Adobe has done some prototyping in this and we've proven that, you know, again, seems to work very nicely for with um, everything we tried it with. Now, the other two things that are worth considering, um, the is signed is signing a pdf so one of the questions a lot of people ask is well i can already apply a digital signature to a pdf why would i want to add this and what if i want to use both and the answer is you absolutely can use both and we think putting both of them together has a lot of benefit um, not the least of which is that it enables compatibility with existing pdf processors so you get the existing signing capability but you can now put in there the audit trail. So even if your PDF processor chooses to ignore the signatures on the, the manifest or, you know, or at least treats them less securely than it does the PDF signature, you still have the ability to validate and incorporate a standardized model for provenance and audit trails. 
What works nicely is that the PDF signature goes after the C2PA signatures, which again fits into the PDF signature model. So nothing breaks. Um, it's a little tricky. Um, and again, it just really has to mean you get your holes right because now we have a hole for the PDF signature and we have a hole for the C2PA manifest, but it works and it can be done. Uh, you also, of course, can support encrypted PDFs. And so this goes nicely with the new integrity protection capability being developed here at the PDF Association in conjunction with uh, ISO. You just, of course, have to use the identity crypt filter because you're not going to encrypt the C2PA manifest itself. Um, here's a, a user interface. This is a, a Adobe showing what it might look like on an image. So you can see that you have the original information on the right. This was the original photo, and then it was modified in Photoshop um, by uh, Sarah. And so we have the information on the left and we have some history. And you can envision the same thing, of course, working with PDFs uh, and how that might look and, and potentially even very more fine grain uh, if you were so inclined. So a lot of work going on here, a lot of UI prototyping and such so uh in closing the organization the c2pa i will also say is open to all which is why we are engaging at diverse communities i'm here talking to the pdf association so we ensure that our work with pdf is aligned with the industry uh we welcome uh anyone to join uh other organizations are welcome uh it, you know please reach out c2pa.org if you'd like to join us uh, we are not prescribing a unified platform. We are instead presenting standards, just like PDF itself. So we're building up a set of technologies that can be utilized in a variety of different manners. And as I mentioned, PDF is one of our key formats. Uh, and again, no surprise given my participation on both sides. So i um, like to thank you all for listening today. As I mentioned, please go reach out to c2pa.org for our specifications, for joining the organization. Uh, and many or all of you know how to find me and I'm always happy to take uh, direct emails and questions. But let's see if anybody has any today. Um, I don't see anything over in our chat pod yet. Duff, anything I missed? Uh, yes, Leonard, there's a question pod and there are now three questions in it. Um, oh, just, just to make a quick note, uh, you can download Leonard's slides from his presentation today in the handouts panel. But uh, there are some questions in the questions pod, and I encourage you to add more. Do you see? I them? apologize, I'm not seeing them. Okay, I'll just bring them Am to I you then. Them to me? Yep. Uh, first Wait. question: How do hard content bindings work with manifests embedded in PDF files? Is the exclusionary hashing model? Is it the exclusionary hashing model that makes this work? Yes, it's absolutely the exclusionary hashing model that makes it work. And I, and I again, I didn't go into the details, but it has it simply has to do if you don't if you're not signing the PDF, it's actually easy. In fact, it's the exact same model that one would use for digitally signing a PDF with respect to creating a whole, which is what you're going to exclude, hashing everything else, incorporating that and then embedding the manifest. And that works perfectly. If you then apply this PDF signature over the top, as I mentioned, there's a little extra trickery, but it works perfectly. Just getting, it's just the, an order of operations problem as to what you have to do when, but it works out. And we talk about this uh, a bit in the specification uh, in what we call the two pass model. Okay. Uh, what happens if you forget to add a manifest in some part of the process, for example, Creation one, manifest one, edit two, no manifest, edit three, manifest three. Oh, I see. Ah, so actually, in that case, it would be manifest two because you didn't put in a second manifest. But mm -hmm. it's an interesting question. So <clears throat> the answer is that there's nothing technically wrong. There's no requirement that every edit, every change have an associated manifest. But what happens in that particular instance in your example is that by whomever added manifest three, they are taking responsibility for the edits that took place in two, as well as their own edits, because they're signing everything that came, they're signing everything that came before, not unlike again how signatures work with PDF, where you're signing everything that comes before. 
So in this case, because it's about trust, we're trusting it. So in other words, if I receive from Duff a, a PDF and I notice that he used a tool that was not C2PA aware to do his editing, but I trust Duff and I do, that I would still be willing to you know, make my changes and sign um, you know, and incorporate my signed manifest because again, it came from Duff, I trust him, I'm not too worried about what he did and everything looked good. But if I received that same type of scenario from Joe Smith, and I don't know Joe, then I'm probably not going to do that, in which case I'm either not going to sign my version or more likely I'm not even going to work with that version. I may go back to the originator and ask for the original in that case. And again, I have the information about who the original is through their manifest. And so I have that choice because I now know whether or not the previous party did what they were supposed to do and incorporated the info. But there are use cases where it's not required or may not be appropriate to include it. Um, I should mm -hmm. mention while I'm on that, and then I know I have a third question. We do fully support uh, anonymous and pseudonymous um, scenarios as well. So uh, we like to use the example of Banksy. So if you wanted to be Banksy, um, that's fine. We support that kind of model as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So we have a third question. Just to follow, yeah. So and a follow up actually to that question yeah, is, sure. what about a mechanism to actively disavow some content? Ah, great question. So we actually have two. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of different methods um, for this. So one is the idea of what we call redaction. Um, should be again very common word in PDF. Uh, we enable downstream processors to redact earlier pieces of information, either because they're now proven to be incorrect or because having them there would uh, cause someone or something harm. Uh, the example we always use uh, is somebody takes a <clears throat> excuse me somebody takes a photograph uh, of some individuals at a, a rally, uh, an anti-something rally. And that picture gets out. And of course, having those faces there could cause problems. So downstream, not only do we want to blur out the faces, but we want to redact out, um, say, the name of the photographer, because that could be potentially problematic or harmful to the photographer. We might want to redact out thumbnails, if there were any thumbnails that were there. And so we support redaction for that method. We also are working on, that's in the current specification. We're also working on a method of retraction, which is mm -hmm. a, a method used in the news and publishing industry. We're still working on the technical details of retraction, but we understand that it's going to be uh, important in those cases where you can't actually go back and modify the asset, but you somehow need to say, provide an updated version that notes that other things are no longer true or no longer valid. Uh, so we're working through the idea of retraction as well. And then finally, of course, we rely on signature um, revocation, lots of R's here, so that um, there are models for revoking signatures and signature revocation models all apply. If, for example, the, tr the person or, or organization that signed something is no longer trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So, um, so another question, different tangent. Yeah. Why was a new standards body needed? Why not ISO or Etsy and so on? Oh, great question. Um, our actually, ex our expectation is that we will take the work that we've done and bring it to one of the other standards bodies. But honestly, none of at the time we started this work about a year or so ago. Um, we approached the various other bodies and none of them were actively were interested in actively taking on the work. And we all felt that it was something that had to be done. And so instead of sitting around for that reason, we went off and we started our work and um, we with the expectation that we will bring it to ISO, we will bring it to somewhere. We haven't decided exactly where it's going to go. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons, as we all know, to various standards bodies. But we do hope to get it approved by an S, a formal SDO at some point. Mm -hmm. What what I Are there any plans or ideas to consider 
and this is a, you know, a PDF century question, I guess, but to consider a visualization of the manifest on the page? Um, no, absolutely not. Um, we hmm. believe very strongly that um, visualizing it on a page or visualizing it on top of an asset of any type um, leads to insecurity because it can be easily forged. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see this if you actually go back. So Etsy, when it published Pades, um, there was a part six to the original Pades, which has never been updated, which was about um, the visual validation of signatures. And a big part of that document expressed exactly this, that the putting it on a page, putting it as part of the content is extremely problematic. Now that said, we expect that um, the viewers, the processors, are going to incorporate it into the UI, much like, say, for example, Acrobat Signature Panel or, or Foxit Signature Panel today, um, or the, you know a UI like I presented. But uh, no, we feel very strongly that uh, it doesn't belong on a page. Uh, and this is admittedly one of the failings of a lot of the e-signature products uh, in the PDF space today because they rely on audit trails being uh, pages of content. And this mm -hmm. is one of the things that by standardizing an audit trail model across the industry, again, this is not only for PDF, but for all these types, um, we can move away from that into something that is more secure and reliable. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, so the assertions concept, um seems similar at least in some ways to the declarations concept that previously published by the PDF Association is is there is there a reason why a, a new model why you've developed a new model um <clears throat> well so the problem with declaration so we we didn't even I'll be honest we didn't even look at declarations specifically but we did look at using so declarations are declared in XMP uh in PDF Mm -hmm. One of the we did look originally, and, and of course, as I mentioned, this work has been going on for about two years now. So, uh, one of the original plans was to do a lot of this in XMP, and we realized that it just, for a variety of reasons, purely relying on XMP doesn't work. Um, the fact that it's a text-based, uh, you know, representation, <clears throat> sorry, um, doesn't work well. In a lot of cases, it's not as secure. It bloats files larger than necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually moved away from the, a number of choices that we might have used in XMP uh, and mm -hmm. did, like I said, uh, early implementations were XMP based. And what we found, again, we just found too many problems. So moving to a uh, more structured model um, works really nicely for us. Uh, it keeps things smaller. Moving to things like Seaboard gives us more reliability because it's much safer to parse Seaboard than it is uh, XML. Uh, you'll also notice that we don't we do support JSON only when it is the native format, and we support XML actually for that matter, when it is the native format of some other standard. Uh, so I mentioned the fact Creative Work. Uh, creative work comes out of schema.org. Schema.org utilizes JSON as a serialization format. And so rather than forcing people to re-serialize things, we say, great, take your JSON and include it. Mm -hmm. um, we also did the same thing with IPTC. Actually, here's something where we aligned with um, recent work at ISO that the PDF Association was involved with. Um, some of you may know that we that ISO just published a JSON LD serialization for XMP, uh, 16684-3. We've actually included that as a reference in C2PA that says, if you want to use XMP, don't use the XML serialization, use the JSON serialization, because it's closer to the other things that we're working with. It gives us uh, data, you know, st more structured data bindings and the like. All right. Okay, we have time for one more question, and actually, sure. uh, two different, same basic question from two different folks, which is, Great. what's what's the roadmap, um, and and what's the timeline for oh, right. when's this when's this going to come along? When will it be available to to regular users and so on? Oh, great question. So, um, as I mentioned, the the specification is due to go 1.0 in uh, by the end of the year, and I would look for um, 
announcements of early prototypes, uh, you know, soon, uh, you know, Adobe has already, of course, committed to uh, providing them in Photoshop. We've demonstrated, um, you know, as you saw there, some, some early work, uh, and I think you'll see that uh, more available shortly. And we also have commitments and work going on by many other members of the organization. Uh, you know, I can't name specific names, but uh, there are a variety of implementations ongoing. And as I said, I think in conjunction with that 1.0 release, you'll see releases from other companies for other formats. You know, as I mentioned, images, videos, audio, PDF, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think you'll see that coming. So uh, the answer is soon. Um, of course, a big part of that is then going to be not only creating these things, but we're gonna to need to see, and, and I think you'll hopefully see some of this as well, uptake from the browser vendors, uptake from uh, social media platforms, uptake from, again, PDF consumption software, et cetera. 